She came to the park for a quiet evening, a rare chance to escape the world's demands. But the peaceful moment shattered when a police officer leaned too close, his presence thick with something darker than authority. What began as a harmless encounter quickly spiraled into intimidation and control, pushing boundaries she never thought would be crossed, especially not by someone sworn to protect. But he had no idea who he was dealing with. Her husband, a powerful FBI chief known for his unbreakable sense of justice, would arrive soon, and the tables would turn. In a city of loyalty, power and secrets, this one moment would reveal everything. The city park stretched before Maya in gentle twilight, bathed in the golden hues of a warm evening. Families strolled along winding paths, children's laughter rang out from the playground, and birds chirped from the leafy branches above. It was a scene of quiet beauty and life, yet Maya's heart remained anchored to the solitary bench she had chosen, tucked beneath a grand old oak tree. She sighed, allowing herself to exhale fully for the first time that day. It wasn't often she could find a moment like this, a moment where everything around her slowed down and allowed her to simply be. The breeze played with the loose curls of her hair, carrying the sweet floral scents of blooming jasmine and freshly cut grass. She closed her eyes for a second, letting the calm of the park ease the week's tensions from her shoulders. Her life was a busy one, filled with responsibilities and expectations. She worked long hours, and with her husband Daniel's demanding role, time together was precious and rare. Tonight, she had hoped they could reclaim a few moments just for themselves. Maya's thoughts drifted to Daniel, her steady, devoted husband. He was more than just her partner. He was a rock, her unwavering support through every challenge. As an FBI chief, Daniel was a man of duty, driven by a commitment to justice and integrity that had only grown stronger over the years. But that same dedication often kept him away, his work consuming him as he tackled case after case with an almost unbreakable resolve. Maya understood this part of him, respected it deeply, even when the long hours left her feeling as if they were worlds apart. She loved his principles, his dedication to doing what was right, and yet tonight all she wanted was a quiet dinner at the park, a moment to feel close to the man she so often had to share with the demands of his position. Tonight, Daniel had promised to meet her here and she had been holding on to that promise all day. She thought of sending him a quick message, a gentle reminder that she was waiting, but something made her pause. Perhaps it was the thought of him surprising her, catching her unawares as she sat lost in her thoughts. With a small smile, she leaned back, closing her eyes and letting herself be lulled by the soft rustling of the trees, the gentle hum of distant conversation, the laughter of strangers mingling with the melody of birdsong. But then, a shadow crossed her face. Maya opened her eyes, blinking as her vision adjusted. A figure loomed before her, blocking the soft glow of the setting sun. It was a man, tall, with a broad frame and a hard, angular face. His gaze was sharp and uncomfortably direct, the look of someone used to being obeyed without question. He wore a police uniform, his badge glinting in the fading light. She squinted, reading the name etched into the silver tag. Officer Rickard. Good evening, he said, his voice smooth yet oddly tense, the kind of voice that held more than a simple greeting. His eyes held hers for a beat too long, an intensity in his gaze that felt invasive. Startled, Maya gave him a polite nod, her instinct telling her to stay calm. Good evening she replied softly, offering a small, courteous smile. But the look in his eyes didn't waver, and the smile that formed on his lips felt anything but friendly. Ricard didn't move. Instead, he sank down onto the bench beside her, taking a seat far too close for her comfort. His shoulder brushed against hers, his arm resting on the back of the bench as he angled his body toward her, invading her space with an air of casual authority. It's a beautiful night, isn't it? he remarked his voice carrying a tone that bordered on familiarity, as though they were already well acquainted. Maya's muscles tensed as she forced herself to stay composed. Yes, it is, she replied, keeping her tone neutral. Her instinct to move was strong, but she didn't want to escalate the situation by appearing uncomfortable. Still, she subtly shifted, inching away from him, 
hoping he'd take the hint. But Rickard leaned in closer, his face now inches from hers, his eyes tracing a slow, deliberate path over her face. He watched her, an almost predatory gleam in his gaze. Do you come here often? He asked, his tone light but with an undertone that felt anything but innocent. Maya forced a polite smile, though the unease in her stomach was growing. Sometimes, she replied, trying to keep her voice steady. It's a nice place to relax. The corner of his mouth lifted in a smirk, and he leaned back slightly, though his gaze didn't waver. It's not every day I get to meet someone like you, he said, his voice dropping a notch. A beautiful woman, sitting all alone. Maya felt a chill run through her at the words, the flattery laced with an edge that felt wrong, almost possessive. She shifted slightly, hoping to create more distance between them. Thank you, she said, her tone polite but strained. I'm actually waiting for my husband. For a brief moment, Rickard's expression shifted, a glimmer of something dark flashing in his eyes before he smoothed his face back into a smirk. Oh, a husband? He repeated, the words tinged with mocking surprise. He must be a lucky man. His hand, resting on the back of the bench, inched closer, his fingers grazing her shoulder. Maya felt her pulse quicken, her discomfort spiking into something closer to fear. She stiffened, pulling back and narrowing her eyes, her tone sharpening. Please, I'm here to enjoy my evening. I'd like to be left alone, but Rickard's hand didn't move. In fact, it drifted lower, brushing against her arm, and then sliding to her knee, his fingers pressing down with a touch that felt possessive. A flash of anger surged through Maya, her patience reaching its breaking point. She pulled her leg away, her voice firm and clear. I said I'm waiting for my husband, you need to back off. The smirk faded from Ricard's face, replaced by a look of cold irritation. His eyes darkened, and his hand dropped to his side, his fingers curling into a fist. For a brief moment his face twisted with a sneer, a look of contempt that sent a fresh wave of unease through her. Without warning he grabbed her shoulder, his grip firm and unyielding. His fingers dug into her skin, his hold strong enough to leave bruises. Maya gasped, the sudden pressure sending a shock of pain down her arm. Before she could react, he gave her a hard shove, and she stumbled, her balance slipping as she felt herself falling. The ground came up fast and she landed on her wrist, pain shooting up her arm as her hand took the brunt of the fall. She winced, dazed, her mind struggling to process the violation of what had just happened. She looked up, her heart pounding and saw Rickard standing over her, his face a mask of smug satisfaction. Her chest tightened as she realized that he felt no remorse, no shame for what he'd done. He was looking at her as though he'd won something, as though her discomfort was a victory he relished. And then, through the haze of pain and confusion, she heard a voice, one that sliced through the moment like a blade. Maya! Relief flooded her as she looked up, and there he was. Daniel, striding across the path, his expression fierce with anger, his eyes blazing as he took in the sight before him. He moved with a force and presence that commanded attention, his tall frame radiating a quiet authority that seemed to fill the space. In that instant, Maya knew she was safe. Her husband had arrived. But as Daniel's gaze shifted from her to Rickard, she saw his calm demeanor harden, the anger simmering just beneath the surface. And for the first time since Rickard had approached her, she felt a surge of strength return, the shock and fear melting into a quiet resolve. This was far from over. Daniel moved swiftly toward Maya, his focus zeroing in on the officer towering over her. The sight of his wife sitting on the ground, visibly hurt and shaken, ignited a fire within him, a fire tempered by years of restraint but one that was now blazing, threatening to break through. Maya, are you all right? Daniel's voice was calm but edged with barely restrained fury. He reached out, helping her to her feet, his eyes scanning her face, searching for any sign of serious injury. Maya's eyes met his, and she saw the tension in his jaw, the tightly controlled anger simmering beneath the surface. I'm okay, she managed, though her voice was trembling and her hand was cradling her sore wrist. But this officer, he... 
He wouldn't leave me alone. I told him I was waiting for you, but he... Daniel's gaze flicked up, his expression hardening as he turned to Rickard. The officer hadn't moved. He stood with his arms crossed, his expression one of irritation rather than remorse, as though he were the one who had been inconvenienced. Excuse me, Daniel said, his voice low but firm. What's going on here? Rickard looked him up and down, a smirk forming on his face. He shrugged, lifting his hands in mock innocence. Sir, this is a private matter. I'd suggest you move along, he said dismissively, his tone dripping with condescension. Daniel's jaw tightened. He had dealt with men like this before, men who hid behind their badges, twisting authority into entitlement. He took a step closer, his voice controlled but cutting. That's my wife you just shoved to the ground. Rickard's smirk faltered for a split second, but he quickly recovered, his gaze sharpening. Your wife, huh? He sneered, glancing at Maya with a look of disdain. Maybe she should have been a bit friendlier. The words struck like a slap, and Maya's face flushed with a mix of anger and humiliation. Daniel took a slow, measured breath, his eyes locked onto Rickard's, the fury in his gaze unmistakable. I don't think you understand who you're dealing with, Daniel said, his tone dangerously calm. My name is Daniel Blake, I'm the FBI chief and you're way out of line. For a brief moment something flickered in Rickard's eyes, a hint of surprise that he quickly masked with a derisive laugh. He straightened, crossing his arms with a swagger that bordered on insolence. Oh, an FBI chief? So you think you can just show up here and tell me what to do? You don't have any jurisdiction here, Blake. Daniel's patience was wearing thin. I'm telling you that you're abusing your authority and this is going to end here and now. I'd suggest you walk away before you make things worse for yourself. But instead of backing down, Rickard's expression darkened. His hand went to his radio, his smirk growing as he held Daniel's gaze with a look of contempt. You're interfering with an officer's duty, he said, his voice mocking. That's a serious offense, Blake. Without breaking eye contact, Rickard lifted the radio to his mouth. Backup requested at the city park, he said, his tone sharp with false urgency. We've got a disruptive civilian interfering with an officer. Might be some trouble. The words made Maya's heart drop. She looked up at Daniel, worry etched across her face, but he gave her a reassuring look, his expression calm, as though to say, I've got this. But she could see the anger simmering beneath the surface, his patience thinning with every second Rickard's smug expression lingered. Within minutes, the air was filled with the sound of approaching sirens. Three squad cars pulled up along the park path, their lights flashing as they parked nearby. Officers spilled out of the vehicles, their expressions serious as they approached. One of the arriving officers stepped forward, a man in his early thirties with a no-nonsense look about him. He glanced between Daniel, Maya, and Rickard, clearly assessing the situation. Officer Rickard, what's going on here? He asked, his tone sharp with authority. Rickard wasted no time in twisting the story to fit his narrative. This man here, he said, gesturing to Daniel with a sneer, was interfering with my duties and became aggressive. He refused to step back when asked. The officer's eyes shifted to Daniel, who stood tall and unwavering, his expression calm but firm. I'm FBI Chief Daniel Blake, he introduced himself, his tone steady. This officer here was harassing my wife, who was waiting peacefully at the park. I stepped in to defend her, and he escalated the situation. But Rickard cut him off, his tone now bordering on frantic as he realized Daniel's words were sinking in with the other officers. I don't care if he's the President of the United States, he snapped, his face twisting with barely concealed contempt. He interfered with a police officer in the line of duty, and that's all there is to it. The officers exchanged uncertain glances. Some of them recognized Daniel's name, but they hesitated, clearly unsure whether to defy Rickard's authority. The tension thickened, and Maya's heart pounded as she watched the scene unfold her worry growing as she saw the officers beginning to close in on Daniel. One of the officers stepped forward, his expression hardening. Sir, I'm going to need you to step back, he said to Daniel, his voice cool but commanding. Daniel's gaze didn't waver. I'm not here to escalate things, he said calmly, but I'm not moving until this officer is held accountable for what he's done. 
Rickard's face twisted with fury, his hand gesturing sharply to the others. Restrain him, he ordered, his voice filled with venom. Let's get him out of here. Before Daniel could respond, two officers seized his arms, wrenching them behind his back with a force that made Maya gasp. They snapped handcuffs onto his wrists, their grip unforgiving as they forced him to his knees. Maya watched in horror, her heart pounding as they treated him with an aggression that was entirely unwarranted. Daniel! She cried, her voice laced with panic as she tried to step forward. But one of the officers intercepted her, his hand held up in warning. Mom, I suggest you stay back, he said firmly, his tone dismissive. Desperation flared in Maya's eyes as she looked at Daniel, her mind racing. She wanted to scream, to tell them who he was, to make them understand the injustice of what was happening. But the words wouldn't come, her voice choked by fear as she watched them haul her husband to his feet and push him toward the squad car. Ricard lingered nearby, watching the scene with a smug smile. He seemed to relish every second of Daniel's detainment, his eyes gleaming with satisfaction as he watched him being shoved into the back of the car. Maybe next time you'll learn to respect the badge, he sneered, his voice filled with twisted satisfaction as he looked down at Maya, his expression cold and triumphant. Looks like you'll be waiting a while. Better get comfortable. Maya felt her hands tremble as she watched the squad car door slam shut behind her husband, the sound echoing in her ears like a gunshot. Every part of her wanted to run to him, to pull him out of this nightmare, but she was powerless, trapped by the cold indifference of the officers around her. The cars began to pull away, the flashing lights and wailing sirens leaving her standing alone in the park, a hollow feeling settling in her chest. She watched as they disappeared down the road, her husband, a man who had dedicated his life to justice, now being treated like a criminal because he had dared to defend her. She stood there, her mind reeling, a mixture of anger and helplessness bubbling up within her. The absurdity, the injustice of it all, left her feeling sick. But beneath the shock, a fierce determination was beginning to rise. She wouldn't let this stand, not without a fight. As the squad car carried Daniel away, Maya stood rooted to the spot a feeling of helplessness washing over her. The empty park now felt cold, as if every bit of warmth and light had drained away with the sight of her husband being taken against his will. She clenched her fists, feeling the bruise forming on her wrist from Rickard's rough grip. She was shaken, but her resolve grew stronger with every second. Maya knew she couldn't let this go unanswered. Her husband was an FBI chief, a man who had dedicated his life to protecting others and upholding justice. The injustice of this situation felt staggering, yet she knew Daniel would fight back if he had any chance. But he was alone, surrounded by officers loyal to Rickard, and his authority didn't seem to matter here. It was up to her to act. Taking a deep breath, Maya pulled her phone from her pocket, fingers shaking as she dialed a number she rarely used, the direct line to Daniel's closest FBI colleague, Special Agent Marcus Chen. She knew that if anyone could help her bring attention to what had just happened, it was Marcus. The line rang twice before he picked up. Agent Chen speaking. Marcus, it's Maya Blake. Her voice trembled slightly, but she forced herself to sound steady. I need your help. Something, something terrible just happened to Daniel. She quickly explained the situation, detailing Rickard's behavior the unprovoked assault, and the false accusations that had led to Daniel's detainment. She could hear the shock in Marcus's silence, and when he spoke, his voice was filled with anger. Stay there, Maya. I'm contacting the Bureau and sending a legal team to the precinct. We'll get him out of this. Thank you, Marcus. Relief mixed with gratitude in her voice. I knew you'd understand. Daniel's one of the best agents we have, Maya, Marcus said firmly. We won't stand by and let this happen. I'll update you as soon as I have news. As she ended the call, Maya felt a glimmer of hope return. The Bureau's involvement would mean more than just a legal defense. It would shine a spotlight on Rickard's actions and hold him accountable. She needed that accountability, not just for herself, but for Daniel, and for anyone else who might have been wronged by Rickard's abuse of power. She turned and hurried toward the precinct, each step fueled by a fierce determination. She was done with the fear, the helplessness. This fight was just beginning. 
Inside the precinct, Daniel was escorted down a narrow hallway, flanked by two officers whose grip on his arms was unnecessarily tight. He held his head high, refusing to let them see his discomfort. Every inch of his body ached from the rough handling, but he maintained his composure, his mind sharp with the realization that this was about more than just one abusive officer. This was a systemic issue, and he intended to bring it to light. The officers led him to a door at the far end of the hallway, separate from the main holding cells. They pushed him inside a small, dimly lit room with a single metal chair bolted to the floor in the center. Daniel's jaw tightened as they forced him into the chair, securing his cuffs to metal loops on the armrests. The setting was clearly meant to intimidate him, to make him feel trapped and vulnerable. Once he was restrained, the two officers stepped back, their expressions unreadable as they positioned themselves by the door, waiting. Daniel stayed silent, his eyes scanning the room, taking in every detail. He knew this wasn't standard protocol. He had been in countless holding cells during his career, but this felt different, designed to demoralize rather than detain. After what felt like an eternity, the door swung open and Rickard entered the room, his face twisted into a smug grin. He crossed his arms, watching Daniel with a gleeful malice that made Daniel's stomach turn. Well, well, look who we have here, Rickard sneered, circling the chair like a predator sizing up its prey. The big bad FBI chief thought you could come here and tell me how to do my job. Daniel met his gaze, his expression unflinching. What you're doing isn't your job, Rickard. It's abuse of power, and when this is over, you'll have to answer for every second of it. Rickard's grin only widened, as if Daniel's words had confirmed something he already knew. You think you're untouchable, don't you? You think that badge of yours makes you better than the rest of us? I think that badge holds me to a higher standard, Daniel replied, his voice steady. And that's something you wouldn't understand. Rickard's smirk vanished, replaced by a cold, calculating look. He leaned in close, his voice dropping to a dangerous whisper. You're in my precinct, Blake. In here, I'm the law. And right now, you're just another troublemaker who needs to be put in his place. Without warning, Rickard motioned to the two officers standing by the door. Show him how we handle troublemakers around here. The officers exchanged a glance, a brief flicker of doubt crossing their faces. But Rickard's gaze hardened, and they quickly moved forward, their expressions turning grim as they carried out his order. One officer struck first, a punch to Daniel's jaw that snapped his head to the side, pain flaring through his face. He gritted his teeth, forcing himself to stay calm, not giving them the reaction they so clearly wanted. Another blow followed, this time to his ribs, the force enough to make him catch his breath. Rickard watched from the corner, his arms crossed, his expression filled with twisted satisfaction. See, Chief? This is what happens when you step out of line. Daniel's body screamed with pain, but he kept his gaze steady, his mind focused. He had endured worse than this. He had survived things that would have broken a lesser man. And he knew that as long as he held on to his resolve, Rickard wouldn't win. Finally, the officers stepped back, their breathing heavy as they looked to Rickard for further instruction. Rickard seemed satisfied, nodding approvingly before gesturing toward the door. Leave him here, he said, his voice dripping with contempt. Give him some time to think about his actions. The officers followed his orders, exiting the room without a word. Rickard paused at the door, casting one last smug look over his shoulder. Remember, Blake he sneered. You're nothing here, just another criminal who crossed the line. With that, he slammed the door shut, leaving Daniel alone in the suffocating silence. Maya arrived at the precinct to find a small crowd gathered outside. Reporters, concerned citizens, and colleagues from the FBI who had been alerted by Marcus. The sight gave her a surge of hope. The public's awareness of the situation could be their greatest asset. As she pushed through the crowd, she spotted Marcus near the entrance, his expression grim as he briefed a group of agents who had come to support them. Maya, he called, relief flooding his face as he saw her. We're going to get him out of there. The Bureau's involved now, and the precinct is under scrutiny. Maya nodded, the strength in his words bolstering her own resolve. Thank you, Marcus. I won't let them get away with this. Together they entered the precinct, moving past officers who watched with wary eyes. The building was filled with a tense energy, 
the air thick with the knowledge that something big was happening. Maya could feel the weight of every glance, the murmurs of officers who had once respected Daniel now questioning their loyalty to Rickard. As they approached the front desk, a senior officer intercepted them, his expression tense. Agent Chen, Mrs. Blake, he greeted them, nodding respectfully. We're aware of the situation. The chief is reviewing the footage from the park now. Maya's heart pounded as she realized the significance of his words. If the footage was being reviewed, then every moment of Rickard's abuse, the harassment, the assault, the false accusations, would be exposed. She could feel the tide beginning to turn, a faint glimmer of justice emerging from the darkness. Where is he? Maya demanded, her voice fierce. I need to see my husband. The officer hesitated but finally nodded, gesturing down a hallway. He's being held in the isolation room, but we're making arrangements to release him. The chief will speak with you both once he's out. Maya and Marcus exchanged a determined look before heading down the corridor, their steps echoing in the silence. The weight of the moment settled over her, and she knew that whatever came next, they were ready to fight. The truth was finally coming to light, and nothing, no amount of power or intimidation, would stand in their way. As Daniel sat alone in the isolation room, the ache of bruises forming on his ribs and jaw was nothing compared to the cold fury simmering within him. He had been trained to withstand pressure, intimidation, even pain. But to experience this abuse from fellow officers, those sworn to uphold the law, was a betrayal that cut deeper than any bruise. He could hear faint murmurs and footsteps outside the room, a reminder that he was, for now, completely at Rickard's mercy. But not for long, he promised himself. Outside, the tension at the precinct was thick, and officers exchanged uneasy glances as the presence of FBI agents, media crews, and outraged citizens grew. Officers who had once worked with or under Daniel had heard the rumors. An FBI chief had been manhandled, even assaulted, by Officer Rickard. Most didn't know what to believe, but the air was filled with a sense that everything was about to change. Just then, the door to the isolation room opened with a creak, and Officer Rickard strode in, accompanied by two of his trusted allies, Officers Reed and Brown. The two officers were seasoned, with years of loyalty to Rickard under their belts. But now, their expressions were guarded, as though something didn't sit right with them. Rickard shot Daniel a smug smile as he stopped a few feet away, arms crossed, his stance cocky. Enjoying the view, Chief? He sneered, his voice dripping with contempt. Daniel lifted his gaze, his expression unyielding. I've seen worse, he replied coolly, his voice calm but laced with iron. Rickard's smirk faltered, if only for a second. He glanced at Reed and Brown, his expression hardening as he signaled them forward. I don't think you understand your position here, Blake. You may be an FBI chief out there, but in here, you're just another criminal. Maybe some time in here will remind you of that. He turned to Reed and Brown. Do your job, he ordered, his voice hard and unforgiving. The two officers hesitated, exchanging an uncertain glance. They had seen Rickard push boundaries before, but this felt different, darker. But years of loyalty and unspoken rules ran deep, and after a brief moment they nodded, moving toward Daniel. One of them struck first, delivering a punch to Daniel's stomach that forced him to double over, gasping for breath. The impact sent a jolt of pain through his bruised ribs, but he forced himself to straighten, his gaze unwavering as he locked eyes with Rickard. Rickard watched, a twisted satisfaction gleaming in his eyes as the second officer delivered a blow to Daniel's jaw. Pain shot through him, but Daniel refused to flinch, meeting Rickard's gaze with defiance. Is that all you've got? Daniel taunted his voice steady despite the pain. He knew that his calm would only infuriate Rickard, and in this moment, infuriating him was all he had left. Rickard's face twisted with rage, his confidence momentarily shaken. You think you're better than us? He snarled, stepping closer, his voice low and venomous. All your titles and badges mean nothing here. I'll make sure you remember that. He leaned in, close enough that Daniel could feel his hot breath on his face. You're going to regret ever crossing me. But Daniel's face remained calm, his voice unwavering. You're the one who should be worried, Rickard. People are watching now, 
and they're not going to let this slide. When this is over, you'll be answering for every single one of your actions. Rickard's expression faltered, a flash of uncertainty crossing his eyes before he masked it with a sneer. He straightened, glancing at Reed and Brown with a smirk. Leave him here. Let him stew for a while. The two officers stepped back, though their expressions were conflicted, doubt flickering in their eyes. They left the room without a word, the door slamming shut with a finality that left Daniel alone in the dim light. Meanwhile, outside the isolation room, the tension among the officers had reached a boiling point. News of Daniel's detainment had spread through the precinct, leaving many officers questioning the events that had led to his arrival in cuffs. Some had worked with him on cases, knew his reputation as a man who held himself and others to the highest standards of integrity. Whispers circulated, doubts forming in the minds of those who had once trusted Ricard. Just then, one of the precinct's veteran officers, Sergeant Lopez, intercepted officers Reed and Brown as they left the isolation room. Lopez had seen his share of questionable behavior under Ricard's leadership, but this incident felt different. It felt wrong. What's going on in there? Lopez demanded, his eyes narrowing as he looked from Reed to Brown. Why is an FBI chief in the isolation room? Reed hesitated, glancing at Brown before he replied. Ricard ordered us to keep him in line, he said quietly, a hint of guilt in his voice. Lopez's expression hardened. And you went along with it? The two officers exchanged an uneasy glance, their loyalty to Ricard beginning to crumble under the weight of Lopez's gaze. Brown shifted uncomfortably, his jaw clenched as he looked away. We thought, we thought we were following orders, but I don't know if this is right anymore. Reed's face reflected the same inner conflict, his brows furrowed. He's not just some guy off the street, Lopez. He's the FBI chief. What Ricard's doing, it doesn't sit right with me. Lopez nodded, his gaze softening slightly as he saw their hesitation. Orders don't excuse abuse, and you know it. Don't let one man's arrogance ruin everything you've worked for. Reed swallowed hard, nodding, his face pale as he realized the weight of his actions. Brown looked down, regret written across his features. What do we do? Reed asked quietly, his voice laced with desperation. Lopez placed a hand on his shoulder, his tone firm but supportive. If you're serious about making this right, go talk to the chief. Tell him what really happened. This precinct's integrity is on the line, and the truth needs to come out. The two officers shared a look, nodding slowly as the gravity of their decision settled over them. With a final glance at each other, they turned and headed toward the chief's office, a sense of resolve in their steps. The precinct chief, a stern and seasoned man named Walters, sat in his office, reviewing a stream of messages from the bureau, from reporters, and even concerned citizens who had gotten wind of the situation. He had been inundated with questions, and the pressure to act was building. Just then, a knock on his door pulled him from his thoughts, and he looked up to see officers Reed and Brown standing there, their faces pale but resolute. Chief, we need to talk, Reed said, his voice steady but his hands clenched at his sides. Chief Walters gestured for them to sit, his gaze steady as he waited for them to speak. Go on, he prompted, his tone neutral but with an undercurrent of expectation. Reed took a deep breath, glancing at Brown before he spoke. We... we were following Rickard's orders, but the way he's treating Chief Blake, Daniel Blake, it's wrong, Chief. He had us rough him up, put him in isolation without a proper charge. We thought we were following procedure, but now... now we see that it was abuse. Chief Walters leaned back, his expression darkening as he processed their words. And you're just realizing this now? he asked his voice laced with disappointment. Brown's face flushed, and he lowered his gaze. We didn't see it for what it was. Rickard's been using his authority for a while, but this time, we crossed a line. Walters nodded slowly, his gaze thoughtful as he weighed their words. After a long silence, he stood, gesturing for them to follow him. We'll deal with this now, he said, his tone brooking no argument. They walked together toward the isolation room, a sense of purpose uniting them. Officers watched as the chief strode through the hall, his face set, 
a ripple of tension spreading through the precinct. It was clear to everyone watching that something significant was about to happen. When they reached the isolation room, Chief Walters turned to Reed and Brown. You two, stay here, he ordered, before nodding to the guard at the door to let him in. Inside the isolation room, Daniel looked up as the door opened to reveal Chief Walters standing there, his face a mask of controlled anger. He stepped inside, closing the door behind him, and met Daniel's gaze, the regret in his eyes unmistakable. Chief Blake, he began, his voice steady but tinged with apology. I'm here to apologize on behalf of this precinct. Officer Rickard's actions are not reflective of our values. He's overstepped, and he will be held accountable. Daniel straightened, the tension in his shoulders easing slightly. I appreciate that, Chief, he replied, his voice calm but firm. But this isn't just about me. Your officer targeted my wife, harassed her, and then escalated the situation to cover his tracks. This kind of behavior has to be rooted out completely. Walters nodded, a flicker of respect in his gaze. I agree, and I'm taking steps to ensure it. I've already started an internal investigation, and Officer Rickard will be suspended pending a full review. A quiet resolve filled Daniel's expression as he looked Walters in the eye. This precinct needs to be a place of integrity, not a sanctuary for abusers. It's time for a change. Walters extended a hand, a silent promise in the gesture. Daniel shook it, feeling a sense of solidarity in the action. As he left the isolation room, he felt a weight lift from his shoulders, but he knew this was just the beginning. Justice was coming, and no one, not even Officer Rickard, would stand in its way. Daniel's release from the isolation room was a momentary reprieve. As he walked alongside Chief Walters, the bruises on his ribs and jaw throbbed with each step, but he kept his face stoic. The past few hours had felt like a twisted nightmare, the abuse of authority he'd witnessed stirring a fury within him he hadn't felt in years. But now, with Maya in his mind and justice on his side, he felt a renewed purpose. The precinct halls were unusually quiet as they walked, the officers they passed offering wary glances, some even avoiding eye contact. Word had spread quickly. Everyone knew that Daniel Blake, the FBI chief, had been mistreated by a fellow officer. There was no more hiding this. Chief Walters stopped in front of his office door, gesturing for Daniel to step inside. Wait here a moment, Chief Blake, he said, his tone professional but underscored with a hint of regret. I'll be calling in Officer Rickard for a discussion. You'll want to be here for it. Daniel nodded, his jaw tightening. I wouldn't miss it. As Chief Walters stepped back out, Daniel allowed himself a moment to sit, letting his body relax, though his mind was still on high alert. He thought of Maya and the resilience she'd shown in getting him released. She had taken action on his behalf, refusing to let this go unnoticed. The thought of her strength brought him comfort, but it also reminded him of the cost of her courage. She'd had to endure Rickard's harassment, her dignity threatened, all because one man thought he could get away with it. The door opened, pulling him from his thoughts. Chief Walters re-entered, followed by Rickard, who entered with his usual swagger, though his confidence looked slightly rattled. Behind him, officers Reed and Brown stood, their expressions a mixture of shame and regret. Daniel noted the tension in their stance. They were no longer standing in solidarity with Rickard. It seemed that guilt had taken root. Rickard, catching sight of Daniel, faltered momentarily, then forced a smirk onto his face. Chief Walters, I don't understand why I'm being questioned like this, he said, the mock indignation evident in his tone. I was only doing my job. Blake here was the one causing a scene. Chief Walters leveled a hard stare at Rickard, silencing him with a single look. Officer Rickard, this is no longer about doing your job. This is about crossing a line. Several lines, in fact. Rickard's smirk faded, his expression hardening as he glanced between Walters and Daniel. With all due respect, Chief, I was dealing with a disruptive civilian. I didn't even know who he was. That's the issue, Walters replied, his tone steely. Whether or not you recognized him, your actions went beyond any reasonable line of duty. Daniel felt the room grow tense as Walters turned his gaze to Reed and Brown. Officers, I believe you have something to add to this discussion. Reed swallowed, 
his gaze dropping momentarily before he spoke. Yes, Chief, I... I followed Officer Ricard's lead. I didn't question it at first, but I see now that I should have. We used excessive force without just cause. Brown nodded, his voice thick with regret. We acted on orders, but that doesn't excuse what we did. We let ourselves be manipulated. I let my loyalty to a colleague blind me to what was right. Ricard's face twisted with anger as he glared at his former allies. You're really going to turn on me now? After everything we've been through? Chief Walters cut in, his tone deadly calm. Ricard, your actions left these officers in an impossible position, and now they're holding themselves accountable. You should do the same. But Ricard's arrogance only grew, his gaze narrowing as he turned to Daniel. This is a setup, isn't it? You're using your position to get back at me because I didn't let you play hero in the park. Daniel's voice was calm, but it carried the weight of years of authority and experience. I didn't need to play hero, Ricard. You made yourself the villain. I was protecting my wife from your abuse. Ricard opened his mouth to retort, but Chief Walters silenced him with a sharp gesture. We've reviewed the footage, Walters said, his voice slicing through the tension. The entire incident at the park, recorded by a bystander, shows everything. Your approach, the way you ignored Mrs. Blake's protests, and how you escalated the situation without cause. And that footage is now all over the internet. Ricard's face drained of color. The confidence that had propped him up until now crumbled as the weight of his actions sank in. The public is outraged, Walters continued. They're demanding accountability. And Officer Ricard, you'll be held responsible for what you've done. Ricard's arrogance wavered, replaced by a growing sense of panic. But, but Chief, I didn't know it would go this far. I, I was just doing what I thought was right. Right. Daniel's voice was quiet but filled with a deadly intensity. Do you call harassing my wife, manhandling her, and then assaulting me for protecting her right? You were using your badge as a weapon. For the first time, Rickard looked truly afraid. His gaze darted from Walters to Daniel, searching for some way out, but he found none. Officer Rickard, Walters said, his voice cold and final. You're suspended, effective immediately. An internal investigation will determine the extent of your misconduct, and if warranted, criminal charges will be filed. Your actions have no place in this precinct. Two officers moved forward, and Rickard instinctively stepped back, his face a mask of shock. You can't do this to me, he sputtered, his voice barely a whisper. You... you can't end my career over this. You ended your own career, Rickard, Walters replied, his tone unyielding. Now you'll face the consequences. As they led him out, Rickard glanced back at Daniel, his face twisted with bitterness. This isn't over, Blake, he spat, his voice filled with a desperate anger. You think you've won, but I'll be back. Mark my words. Daniel's gaze remained steady, unwavering. You made your choices, Rickard. Now live with them. As the door closed behind Rickard, the tension in the room finally began to ease. Officers Reed and Brown both looked visibly relieved, their shoulders sagging as the burden of their guilt lifted, though their expressions remained serious. Chief Walters turned to Daniel, extending his hand. Chief Blake, I'm deeply sorry for what you and your wife endured. This should never have happened. Daniel shook his hand, a faint flicker of gratitude in his eyes. Thank you, Chief Walters, I appreciate that. Walters nodded, his face softening slightly. I assure you, measures will be put in place to ensure this kind of abuse never happens again. Ricard's actions have made it clear that we need a serious overhaul. Daniel nodded. I'm glad to hear it. This isn't just about me or Maya. It's about everyone who could be vulnerable to an officer like Rickard. The system needs change, and I hope this is a wake-up call. The chief nodded, a renewed determination in his eyes. We'll make sure it is. As Daniel exited the precinct, he spotted Maya waiting just beyond the entrance, her face lighting up with relief the moment their eyes met. She hurried over, and he enveloped her in his arms feeling her warmth and strength radiate through him. You're okay, she whispered, her voice filled with a mixture of relief and lingering worry. I'm okay, he replied, holding her close. Thanks to you. 
You were incredible, Maya. She pulled back slightly, looking up at him with fierce determination. No one does this to my family and gets away with it. I knew you'd fight for justice, but I couldn't just sit back and watch. He kissed her forehead, his voice softening. I don't deserve you. Maya smiled, her expression warm but resolute. We deserve each other, Daniel, and we're going to make sure this doesn't happen to anyone else. As they walked away from the precinct, hand in hand, they felt a renewed sense of purpose, a shared mission that transcended any one act of injustice. They would keep fighting, not just for themselves, but for those who couldn't, for those who lived under the constant threat of people like Rickard. The journey ahead would be long, but they would face it together, stronger and more resilient than ever. As Daniel and Maya left the precinct, a gathering crowd outside greeted them with a mixture of curiosity, concern, and outrage. Word of what had happened, an FBI chief wrongfully detained and mistreated by a fellow officer, had spread, igniting a firestorm of controversy across the city and beyond. Reporters and citizens alike were clamoring for answers, demanding accountability for what they now saw as an undeniable abuse of power. Within hours of the initial incident, the footage of Ricard harassing Maya in the park had gone viral. It wasn't long before the story dominated social media, with hashtags like hash justice for Maya and hash end police abuse trending nationwide. The footage left little room for doubt, showing Officer Ricard's predatory behavior, his inappropriate advances, and the brutal arrest of Daniel when he tried to intervene. Reporters and activists quickly picked up on the story, and soon the precinct found itself at the center of a media frenzy. Questions mounted. How could this happen to someone of Daniel's rank? What would happen to Ricard? And most importantly, how many others had suffered similar treatment? The backlash was swift and intense, sending shockwaves through the precinct and beyond. While Daniel tended to his injuries and began the process of recovering from the physical ordeal, Maya worked tirelessly. She contacted legal experts, allies in the media, and colleagues from Daniel's network within the FBI. This wasn't just about justice for them as individuals, it was about uncovering a broader issue of unchecked abuse within the police force. Maya coordinated interviews with reporters, sharing the details of her story and highlighting the larger systemic issues at play. She emphasized that while Daniel's position as an FBI chief gave him the resources to fight back, countless others had experienced similar abuse without any avenue for justice. Her voice, strong and unyielding, became a beacon for those who had been silenced. People from all over the country reached out, sharing their own experiences, each story adding to the growing call for reform. Maya knew the tide was turning, that this public outcry was just the beginning of a larger movement. Meanwhile, Daniel's colleagues at the FBI threw their full support behind the couple, with Marcus Chen leading the charge. He organized an independent team to investigate Rickard's record, digging deep into his disciplinary files, uncovering a history of complaints that had been dismissed or buried by superiors. Each discovery painted a darker picture of Rickard's abuse of power and the complicity of those who had protected him. The Chief's Intervention and Suspicion of Corruption As the public pressure mounted, Chief Walters knew he had to act. A police department cannot stand in the face of such scrutiny without a serious response, and with the FBI's interest now firmly fixed on Rickard's behavior, Walters took action. The precinct held a press conference to address the events. Chief Walters faced a crowd of reporters, their questions firing off in rapid succession as he took the podium. We recognize the gravity of the situation involving Officer Rickard, Walters began, his voice measured. His actions do not reflect the values of our precinct or our mission to serve and protect this community. Effective immediately, Officer Rickard has been suspended and we are working in full cooperation with the FBI's investigation into any potential misconduct. A reporter raised a hand, cutting through the crowd's murmur. Chief Walters, is there any indication that Officer Rickard had a history of similar behavior? And if so, why was it overlooked? Chief Walters hesitated, but only briefly. He knew the question was inevitable. As part of our investigation, we are reviewing all complaints and disciplinary records associated with Officer Rickard. 
Any failure to address misconduct will be thoroughly investigated. We are committed to transparency, accountability, and ensuring that this never happens again. The press conference marked a significant turning point. The statement from Walters, coupled with the FBI's involvement, showed the public that this was more than just an isolated incident. The anger and frustration that had simmered for so long within the community had finally reached a breaking point. Back inside the precinct, officers Reed and Brown sat in a quiet corner of the locker room, both grappling with the weight of their actions. They had chosen loyalty to a man over their duty to protect the public, and now the full scope of that decision was bearing down on them. Reed broke the silence first, his voice tinged with regret. We stood by, Brown. We let this happen. All because we didn't want to go against Rickard. Brown nodded, the shame evident on his face. We let him manipulate us. We should have spoken up, should have, I don't know, stopped him somehow. Reed's hands clenched into fists. This can't be how we're remembered, as officers who stood by and let someone abuse their power. I don't know about you, but I'm done letting fear dictate my actions. With a sense of renewed purpose, Reed and Brown went to Chief Walters, offering a full account of their role in the incident and a detailed record of every questionable command they had followed under Rickard's orders. They shared stories of other incidents where Rickard had used his authority to intimidate or manipulate, painting a clear picture of a man who had been unchecked for far too long. Their confession became a key element in the case against Rickard, solidifying the grounds for his suspension and upcoming criminal charges. Their choice to come forward was an attempt to make amends, but it was also a turning point for the precinct. Their bravery encouraged other officers to reflect on their own actions, to question whether they had allowed loyalty to Rickard to cloud their judgment. As the investigation continued, Daniel and Maya stood together a united front against the system that had allowed this to happen. They were invited to share their story on major news outlets, where they spoke not just of the incident itself, but of the broader issue of unchecked power within law enforcement. Our experience shouldn't have happened, Daniel said during an interview, his voice steady but filled with conviction. No one should have to fear the very people sworn to protect them, but too often loyalty within the ranks overrides accountability and the consequences can be devastating. Maya, sitting beside him, added, This isn't just about one officer. It's about a culture that allows people like him to feel untouchable. We need reform, not just to protect people like my husband and me, but to protect everyone who might not have the platform to speak up. Their words resonated deeply, echoing through living rooms across the nation. Calls for reform grew louder and their story became a rallying cry for those who had long waited for change. In the weeks that followed, public outcry only intensified. Citizens organized rallies, activists and community leaders called for deeper investigations, and lawmakers promised to push for legislative reforms aimed at addressing police misconduct and increasing transparency within departments. One afternoon, as Maya was preparing for yet another interview, her phone buzzed with a message from Marcus. Rickard's officially under investigation. We're looking into charges and Chief Walters is committed to cleaning house. This is far from over, but we're making progress. Maya's heart lifted at the message. She knew this was just the beginning. But it was a victory nonetheless. A small but crucial step toward holding Rickard and those like him accountable. When she shared the news with Daniel, he simply took her hand, a small, tired smile on his face. We did it, Maya. We're making a difference. She squeezed his hand, feeling the truth of his words settle over her. And we'll keep going, for as long as it takes. Together they stood at the forefront of a movement that extended beyond their personal experience. Their fight had become a beacon of hope, a symbol of resilience in the face of corruption. As the days passed, the case against Ricard grew stronger fueled by the testimonies of fellow officers, the damning footage, and the determination of a community unwilling to be silenced. But for Daniel and Maya, the battle for justice was far from over. They knew there was much work left to be done, reforms to fight for, voices to amplify, and a system to change. Yet for the first time since that harrowing night in the park, they could see a glimpse of hope on the horizon. Justice was finally in reach, 
and they were ready to seize it. The FBI investigation into Officer Rickard's conduct revealed a disturbing pattern of abuse stretching back years. Complaints from civilians, dismissed disciplinary warnings, and cases of intimidation all painted a chilling picture of a man who had used his position to serve his own ego. More unsettling were the records showing that some of Rickard's actions had been quietly covered up by superiors who turned a blind eye, protecting him in exchange for his loyalty. For Daniel, the findings confirmed what he had suspected. Rickard was not an anomaly, but a symptom of a larger systemic issue. Too often, loyalty and hierarchy within the ranks allowed officers like Rickard to go unchecked. But now, with the FBI's weight behind the investigation, the curtain had been pulled back, and there was no going back. The findings ignited a firestorm within the department. Officers who had once stood by Rickard found themselves questioned, their loyalty under scrutiny. Chief Walters, determined to restore trust, took immediate action, suspending not only Rickard but several other officers who had enabled his behavior. When the press got a hold of the investigation results, the response was overwhelming. Headlines decried the culture of corruption within the precinct, while citizens expressed their frustration in town halls and rallies. Public outcry was intense, and for the first time, the department was forced to reckon with its history of protectionism and silence. On a bright but cold morning, Rickard arrived at the precinct, flanked by his lawyer and looking visibly rattled. He was scheduled to meet with Chief Walters and the FBI team one last time before formal charges were filed. Daniel and Maya were invited to attend the hearing, an opportunity to confront the man who had wronged them and see the justice they had fought so hard for begin to take shape. In the sterile conference room, Rickard's usual swagger was gone. His face was pale and he avoided looking at Daniel and Maya, who sat across from him, their expressions resolute. Marcus Chen led the hearing, outlining the charges and the evidence gathered against Rickard, his tone unyielding. After detailing the allegations, Marcus turned to Rickard. You abused your position, Officer Rickard. You targeted an innocent woman, assaulted her husband, and misused your authority to silence anyone who stood in your way. You've betrayed the very principles you swore to uphold, and now you will face the consequences. Rickard's lawyer murmured something in his ear, but Rickard didn't respond. Instead, he glanced up, meeting Daniel's gaze for the first time. A flicker of bitterness crossed his face, but there was no defiance left. This isn't over, he said softly, though the words carried none of the threat they once had. They sounded hollow, defeated. Daniel held his gaze, his voice steady. For you, it is. The finality in Daniel's tone was unmistakable, and Rickard's face paled further. As he was escorted out of the room by two officers, the weight of his actions pressed down on him visibly, a man brought to ruin by his own choices. Maya watched him go, a quiet sense of closure settling over her. Rickard's downfall was only one victory, but it was a powerful one. She reached over, taking Daniel's hand in her own, and he gave her a small, grateful smile. They had fought for this together, standing as a united front against forces that had tried to silence them. And now, at last, they were free from the shadow Rickard had cast. In the following weeks, the ripple effects of Rickard's suspension and charges spread through the department. Chief Walters, in a bold move, launched a full internal audit, promising transparency and accountability. Officers found complicit in Rickard's abuses were removed from their posts, and the department implemented strict new policies to prevent future misconduct. New training programs focused on ethical conduct and bias were introduced, alongside mandatory accountability checks. Officers were now required to report any incidents of abuse or misconduct, and failing to do so carried severe consequences. The precinct's culture began to shift, the once unbreakable chain of silence giving way to a new era of transparency. The community, too, played an essential role in the reform. Citizens demanded more, holding officers accountable through community oversight panels and increased public input into policing practices. Daniel and Maya's story became a powerful reminder of the importance of standing up against injustice, inspiring citizens and officers alike to advocate for fairness and integrity. A month later, Daniel and Maya returned to the park where it had all begun. 
The trees had turned shades of golden amber, the air crisp and filled with the scent of autumn leaves. They walked together along the familiar paths, their hands intertwined, savoring the simple peace they had fought so hard to reclaim. Stopping by the bench where Maya had first sat that night, Daniel looked out over the quiet scene before them, a feeling of deep gratitude washing over him. I never thought we'd come back here like this, he said, his voice soft. Maya smiled, squeezing his hand. We came out of it stronger, she replied, and we made a difference. That's what matters. Daniel turned to her, his expression filled with admiration. You were incredible, Maya. Without you, this wouldn't have been possible. She looked up at him, her eyes warm. I think we both know that we couldn't have done this alone. We were a team. They sat together on the bench, the city bustling in the distance, yet everything around them felt quiet and still. After all they had endured, this moment felt like a victory, a testament to their resilience, their love, and their shared commitment to justice. The story of their fight became a catalyst for change sparking conversations and inspiring reforms across the nation. They had stood against abuse, demanded accountability, and emerged stronger than ever. And as they sat there in the park, their journey came full circle, a reminder that even in the face of darkness, the light of justice would always prevail.